Morning everybody, let's talk about diaphragmatic hernias. Now I know it's Monday, There's we're, I'm, I'm done with endocrinology, so we don't have to worry about that. I just don't have time, i got to start putting other stuff in. So there'll be some odd topics here on Mondays and Tuesdays. So diaphragmatic hernias, it is GIGU, it is week 8, it is Monday, and it's the spring of 2021. And here we go. Remember the anatomy. This is an eye to S view, kind of looking at the, the dome of the diaphragm from the abdominal view. If you're ant man in the abdomen, abdomen and you're looking up, this is what you'd see. And so remember, we have three holes the, the hiatus, the cobble hiatus for the inferior vena cava. And then the esophageal hiatus. You guys are experts on that. We've talked a lot about that. And the aorta, or the height, the height is here for the abdominal aorta. The aortic hiatus is right here. But yeah, the esophageal hiatus, we've talked about that. <coughs> and uh, diaphragmatic hernias, a strong, a.k.a. hiatal hernias is how most people know this. So, But know that they're the same. Occurs when the abdominal esophagus or the fundus, yeah, that's right, the fundus of the stomach or and or the abdominal, the abdominal part of the esophagus can herniate upwards into the thoracic cavity. And that's not good. And we'll look at the different causes. It could be an abnormal, usually it's an abnormal esophageal hiatus, but it could be a hole in the diaphragm too. So usually congenital, you're usually born with that type. And uh, yeah, that's not good. Uh, the main sequela, and here's a picture of this. You can see the uh, the di the stomach has slid right up into the thoracic cavity here. Here's the diaphragm. And uh, can you imagine trying to swallow food like this? And we'll see here in a second the different types. There's four different types we'll talk about. Uh, so what is the main sequelae of this uh, condition? Only about 10% are actually symptomatic. Yeah, only 10%. So a lot of people have this and don't even know it. The most common problem, if your lower esophageal sphincter slides up into the uh, thoracic cavity, it's not going to work. So there's nothing to stop acid from coming up. So most common problem is GERD and its sequelae. Co chronic GERD can lead to Barrett's esophagus, which can lead to cancer. Uh, and then if the fundus gets up there, we can see there are certain situations where it pinches the esophagus and you can't swallow, so you get dysphagia. There's three main types. Cat is the uh, not common annular tendon. Remember, uh, we talked about that in anatomy. Um, that's where the it attaches the uh, the rectus muscles, of the extraocular muscles of the eye. But you can use this for this as well: congenital hernias, acquired hiatal hernias, and traumatic hernias. We're not going to worry about traumatic ones. We'll look quickly at congenital hernias. Um, so congenital means from birth. Developmental, also kind of an AKA for congenital, from birth. And it's caused by a flat-out hole in the tendinous portion of the diaphragm. You just the, the child is born with a hole, and it sucks this hole because of the strong negative pressure in the thoracic cavity. And the positive pressure in the abdominal cavity, that's a pushing, pulling type force. So it can pull uh, intestines and the stomach. It could be pulled up through there. But it can pull intestines and mesentery and things inside. That's typically discovered quite quickly. Um, and it is a medical emergency, a surgical emergency. Um, because if you have intestines in your thoracic cavity, it's going to squish your lung. And the compressed, cause an atelectasis actually child will have trouble breathing, but the, the lung won't develop right, so it needs to be fixed. Here's a cartoon of it. Um, you can see here where we have intestines up, and the lung is right here. It's just squished. Hopefully you can see my pointer, my laser pointer. Here's a x-ray of a child with this problem. You can see uh, it's caused a small bowel obstruction. Look at all the gas from all the bacteria build up in here. And yep, here's the other lung would be on this side, and where's the where's the left lung? It's all smashed flat, so that has to be repaired. That's all we'll say about congenital. 
uh, acquired are by far the most common. These are the ones you're going to run into. They're seen in about 2% of adults, so they're rare, but they still happen. They're not like super rare like Marfan syndrome. Interestingly, different populations and, and different uh, populations have different prevalences of these. And uh, people in Africa, for example, have a very low prevalence. They don't tend to get these. There are two main subclasses. So this is important. Look at all the stars here. So there's two types, two flavors of acquired diaphragmatic hernia. Now, if you're on a board or my test, if you just see diaphragmatic hernia or hiatal hernia, you assume that it's acquired, right? They're not going to probably put acquired. If they want, if they want you, if the, if it's a question about a congenital diaphragmatic hernia, they'll put congenital down. So there's two main types of hiatal hernias. There's sliding hiatal hernias, which only has one subclass, and there's rolling hiatal hernias, which have three additional classes. So let's get into these things. And basically, a sliding hiatal hernia occurs when, when the fundus stays put, the fundic region of the stomach stays put, but the abdominal esophagus gets pulled up into the thoracic cavity. This is all thoracic cavity without the lungs here, negative pressure. And the lower esophageal sphincter gets pulled out of place. So that's no good. We'll look at that more in depth in a second. The rolling, now there's a couple of rolling types, but the most common is this type, well, arguably the most common is where the fundus comes off its attachments and the fundus gets sucked up yet the lower esophageal sphincter stays put so but there's three types of these so let's let's get into these different different types here that's not the picture of it oh I didn't take that one out yeah I tried to make this one a little see they the author forgot to he forgot to remove the fundus, so I removed the fundus there. Now the fundus is up there. Anyway, um, what holds the, esoph the abdominal esophagus in place? I think we did we talk about this. Uh, the phrenoesophageal ligaments, um, they attach and anchor the esophagus in place so the abdominal portion of the esophagus stays in the abdominal region. There's actually four of these. There's a, these right and left superior uh, phrenoesophageal ligaments and the right and left inferior phrenoesophageal ligaments. And um, here they are. I can draw them. I think I have my tools here. Yeah. So they anchor into here and tancher into the uh, and attach down into the diaphragm, anchoring it. So if it tries to pull up, um, these are going to pull tight and and keep it in place. Uh, and vice versa, there's also inferior phrenoesophageal ligaments um, that do the same thing. It prevents the esophagus from pulling down. I don't know of any conditions where it actually pulls down. It always pulls up, to my knowledge, because of this negative pressure here and this positive pressure in the abdominal cavity here. <coughs> Here's a better picture of it. So, yep, uh, freno, fren, freno means diaphragm, esophagus means esophagus. So, freno, esophageal ligaments, upper ones, are the key. And we can see there's the diaphragm, and we can see the abdominal portion of the esophagus here, which we've talked about. And there's the fundus, fundic region is right there. All right, so let's look at the sliding hernia. It's also called a type 1. If you say, oh, you, you, got the, you have a type 1 hernia. Um, it's an AKA sliding hiatal hernia, sliding diaphragmatic hernia, sliding hiatal type 1 hernia. You can put all those words in different combinations. Um, I remember one kind of looks like a slide. That's it. This picture is burned in my brain. So one is a slide. It looks like a slide, and that's exactly what happens. It's acquired. There's no subtypes. It's by far the most common. 90% of all any type of hiatal hernia is going to be a sliding hiatal hernia. It's very simple to uh, to happen. But remember, they're not all symptom. Most of them aren't symptomatic. 
and it occurs when the abdominal esophagus uh, and the lower esophageal sphincter slide upward into the thoracic cavity. And so how can that happen? Well, it means something went wrong with those superior or upper phrenoesophageal ligaments. They got broken, they got degenerated, and the key with a sliding hiatal hernia is the fundus stays put. It doesn't go up into the thoracic cavity. That is the key. It's diagnosed with a barium swallow. I think we're going to talk about that more toward the end of this. And here's a perfect picture of it. So here's the superior uh, frontal esophageal ligaments are stretched way out and they've let the lower esophageal sphincter is right here. And that remember that should be at the level of the diaphragm. Right? So it's all stretched out. Uh, the right crust is also stretched out. Remember we said the right crust also of the diaphragm also helps this situation. So basically you have no lower esophageal sphincter now. It doesn't work because it's in a negative environment and so acid can bubble up into here real, real easily. The fundus is still in the normal position. Got it? What's the cause of this? Really age-related degeneration, we said as you get older, the sphincters start to loosen up, you kind of degenerate away and muscles become lax. There's no way to exercise uh, your muscles down there or there's no way to strengthen your phrenoesophageal ligaments so they just kind of uh, get loose. People with the connective tissue disorders, Marfan's, Louis Steet, Cello Standler's, um, they're at risk for this because their tissue is, their ligaments are more stretchy to begin with. And um, yeah, because of that, you get a widening of the esophageal hiatus. You get a loosening of the crust, so the right crust. Remember we said only the right crust is lassoed around the esophagus to create that to help, be, help beef up that lower esophageal sphincter. Um, and yeah, and most importantly, those upper or superior phrenoesophageal ligaments, they get stretchy and they don't work. Another etiology, which could well be in combination with age-related changes, uh, is chronic GERD. Maybe you don't have the greatest lower esophageal sphincter to begin with. And GERD will shorten, it'll shrink being bathed by acid over and over and over, it'll shrink the distal part of the esophagus. Uh, and as the esophagus shrinks, it gets pulled up naturally. And so people with chronic GERD are also at risk for hiatal hernia. Some other rare, super rare conditions, sarcoidosis, scleroderma. Of course, esophageal injury, if you accidentally swallowed acid or something like that, it could shrink the esophagus as well. Um, there are some risk factors. Uh, so people who have in naturally increased, well not naturally sometimes, but they have increased intra-abdominal pressure, they're at risk. Uh, people with COPD who are coughing all the time, every time you cough it greatly raises the intra-abdominal pressure uh, and that, inf uh, that can encourage the esophagus to slide or the fundus to slide up. Uh, obesity increases in uh, all of these things increase IPA interabdominal pressure L jobs where you have to lift heavy pregnancy multiple pregnancies these all push have a increase the pushing force uh, from the abdomen into the thoracic cavity and then yeah you can get into a vicious cycle uh, if the lower esophageal sphincter is now up in the thoracic cavity it's going to increase the amount of GERD it doesn't work and then the GERD the GERD is going to start to shrink the esophagus, right? So the GERD will uh, cause reflux. And as the esophagus shrinks, it'll pull the lower esophageal sphincter farther up into the thoracic cavity, which worsens the GERD. And so you get this kind of vicious cycle. Uh, what's the main sequelae of type 1? We already said this one. Esophageal reflux disease, GERD and its sequelae, erosive esophagitis, then the Barrett's esophagus, and then if something isn't done, esophageal carcinoma. Key point, study point, type 1, the most, by far the most common type of hiatal hernia, does not cause dysphagia in and of itself. Right? We need to go into type 2 to talk about that. Um, 
What about GERD? What's the prevalence of GERD in people with sliding hiatal hernias? About 50% of patients with moderate to severe GERD when they undergo their endoscopic evaluation and their barium swallow, they have a hiatal hernia. So it's, it's super, super common people with GERD to have hiatal hernias. All right, let's talk about the second class of these acquired hiatal hernias or acquired diaphragmatic hernias, and that would be the rolling diaphragmatic hernias. There's three more types, um, and remember type 1 was the sliding hiatal hernia. Type 2, 3, and 4 are the rolling hiatal hernias. Okay, sometimes these are called paraesophageal hernias. Paraesophageal hernias is an AKA. Uh, much less common than type 1. About 5% of all hiatal hernias fall into this category. So your odds are you're not going to get this. It's going to be a slider. Um, but let's talk about them. Uh, let's talk about type 2 rolling hiatal hernia. Uh, this one occurs when the fundus goes through the lower esophageal sphincter. But the lower esophageal or the fundus migrates up through the esophageal hiatus, but the lower esophageal sphincter stays put. Got it? So fundus is up in the thoracic cavity, lower esophageal sphincter is still in its normal place in the esophageal hiatus. Okay? Um, and so now we have a trouble um, because the lower esophageal sphincter is in the esophageal hiatus, and so is the fundus of the stomach. So that's too much, too many structures. So it pinches the lower esophageal sphincter. See how that works? Um, these also tend to roll anteriorly when they get, when the stomach, when the hiatus goes through, it tends to roll to the anterior, uh, which worsens the compression. Um, so what do you think the problem's going to be in these people? Are they going to be able to swallow things? happened here? Got two of the same slides. No, they can't swallow. So here's a picture of it. So now we have the lower esophageal sphincter, right? You guys remember? remember it's kind of this beefed up region right here. It's where it's supposed to be, but now we got the fundus of the stomach sucked up in there. Um, and so you can't swallow. You get dysphagia. All right. So you get dysphagia or dinophagia, maybe Remember, dysphagia is discomfort swallowing. Odinophagia is flat out pain swallowing. And then you can have globus feeling like something stuck in your throat. So yeah, food has a hard time getting through. Uh, and one thing, these patients, and here's the question, do these patients have GERD? No, they don't have GERD because th there's no acid. The, the lower esophageal sphincter is super beefed up because the fundus of the stomach is in there. Now, this is a common one, too, of the different rolling types. Some say this is the most common rolling hiatal hernia. It's, it's sometimes called a mixed hiatal hernia or a true parasophageal hernia. This is a type 3 rolling hiatal hernia. Um, and, yeah, this one's a little weird. So in this case, not only is the lower esophageal sphincter inside the thoracic cavity, but so is the fundus. Okay, so you can have, that's why it's considered a mixed tidal hernia. That makes sense. There's a picture. So we got a pouch way up inside the thoracic cavity. This is the abdominal cavity down here. Lower esophageal sphincter is way up here. And so, yeah, that creates a unique situation. So patients can have a mixture of GERD symptoms because the lower esophageal sphincter doesn't work real well, but you can get a big backup of food in here uh, at certain times, maybe not all the time, uh, but that can cause a roadblock. And you can have trouble swallowing if this gets all filled up with, uh, with food that didn't make it into the stomach. So you can get kind of mixed symptoms. You can get dysphagia and GERD symptoms going on at the same time. Morrison says that he believes this is the most, uh, the most common type of rolling hiatal hernia. Okay, and just here's another example of it. You can see lower 
type 2 sliding hiatal or type 2 rolling hiatal hernia, lower esophageal sphincter stays put. Type 3 hiatal hernia, the lower esophageal sphincter is in the thoracic cavity, so is the fundus. Got it? Here's a barium swallow. Uh, we can see probably the, the diaphragm would be right about here. Let's see, I can draw that in. So the diaphragm would be probably sitting like right about on this level. And yeah, lower esophageal sphincter would be right here. And you can see how the dye has went in this fundic region of the stomach. So that's a type 3. So if I put a picture on the exam, you'd be able to tell. You could tell me that's a type 3 rolling hiatal hernia. Or maybe I'll just say a type 3 hiatal hernia. You should know that. All right. <clears throat> then we have the type 4. This is super rare. This is this is emergency. Um, so it's more severe uh, than the other types of hernia. This occurs when the, in addition to the esophagus and stomach getting sucked up, so lower esophageal sphincter is up in the thoracic cavity, uh, the fundus of the stomach is up, the hole is so big that you're actually sucking up intestine into the thoracic cavity as well. And once you get a, so a intestine going through that, that little esophageal hiatus, that can be a source of small bowel obstruction. And that's not good. Uh, we've talked about that already. If the fecal material normally gets pushed through the intestine by peristalsis, uh, if it gets blocked, you can get a backup of intestinal material and the bacteria run wild and they uh, can have a party and they can grow into the back into the wall of the intestine and rupture the wall. It can get so bad. So that's a bad deal. Greater, here's a picture. Lower esophageal sphincters up there. Uh, the fundus of the stomach is up there. Now we got intestine. Can you imagine trying to push intestine, a fecal material through this intestine? You can't. And so you're going to get a huge backup. You even got greater omentin up, up there as well. All right. Yep. And patients will have a mixture of symptoms. In addition to GERD and dysphagia, uh, they can get intestinal obstruction, as we said, and that can lead to an incarceration of the intestine and a strangulation and even a perforation of the intestine can lead to uh, infection, uh, in a thoracic infection, and can get into the peritoneum, peritoneal cavity as well, and that's not a good, it's a medical emergency. Um, as a chiropractor, what do you do with these patients? Well, you're probably, if you suspect them, you're going to refer them to a gastroenterologist, uh, and that's all you have to do. Just send them a referral slip, keep a copy of that slip to prove you made the referral just in case something happens and that's it. Um, what will the what will they do? What will the GI doc do? Well he'll order an upper GI and uh, that's a barium includes a barium swallow and you can kind of light up the esophagus and see what the morphology looks like. Um, they can also do endoscopic evaluation as well. I didn't put that in there but that's what they'll do as well. And then mammometry if they're having trouble with dysphagia just to make sure it's not like a nutcracker esophagus or other esophageal problems. And then ultimately if the complaints are bad enough they'll do surgery. We said the type 4 hiatal hernias, those are the surgery, surgery. Whether the patient's symptomatic or not, that's just, that's just asking for an intestinal obstruction to start, small bowel obstruction to start. Those have to be fixed. Uh, the other ones type 1, 2, and 3, they're kind of a watchful waiting type thing. Um, so uh, it all depends on the patient's symptoms. Of course, you don't want GERD, right? We said that can lead to Barrett's esophagus, which can lead to, to esophageal carcinoma, which has a really bad prognosis. Um, so, all right, that's the story. So we'll see you tomorrow in the next lecture. I won't see you, but we'll, you'll hear me tomorrow in the next lecture.